All right, thanks so much for that introduction. And uh, that is strange that David just had this uncontrollable urge to go to Texas. I mean, a few years ago, I understand it, but now you all have a Whataburger, so I don't see the point. But anyway, thank you so much for uh, allowing us to come here. And David did ask me to fill in for him, so I'm going to be uh, clen uh, pinch hitting tonight. So uh, if, we did, if you would, just join me in a word of prayer before we start this evening. Father, we are so thankful for all the many blessings that you've given to us. We appreciate this congregation and the, the work that they continue to do both in this community and abroad. We thank you so much for the opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to learn more about your word and to seek to understand you and increase our knowledge of you and our love for you as well. Father, we pray that you would be with each and every one of us as we go throughout your word this evening, that we would give it the correct amount of seriousness and contemplation so that we may continue to grow closer to you. Please bless all those that are going to be traveling, David, and all the rest that are going to be going about for the holidays, and we pray that you would give each, them, give each of them a safe trip, both to and from their destination. All these things we pray in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so David told me I was allowed to talk on whatever I wanted to, so uh, first thing that came to my mind was snakes. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I'd, I've had this one in my hip pocket for a while. Uh, the Savior and the Serpent, so that's going to be our topic of discussion this evening because there is a few things that happen in the Old Testament where Jesus actually gives us insight into some kind of Old Testament story or analogy that he'll bring into the New Testament. And I think that it's very interesting that we don't talk about this one all that often, but this is one of the very few times where Jesus directly takes an Old Testament story and relates it to his life. And so it's interesting that this is one of the ones that he chose because it's not a very long story in the Old Testament. It's not one that is given a ton of attention in the Torah or the first five books, the books of the law. And yet, this is one of the ones that Jesus actually chooses to relate to himself in the New Testament. So if we look at John 3, verses 12 through 15, and I do think it's important as you're turning there to remind you that the context of this particular passage is Jesus speaking to the Pharisee Nicodemus. And he's having this conversation with him, and he gets into a lot of different topics about uh, scripture and the fulfillment of them, and he talks about this whole controversy between things of the flesh and things of the spirit. He talks a little bit about baptism and being born again, and Nicodemus is having a hard time understanding some of these things, and so to help him out with this, Jesus actually brings this up in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, where he says, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will, uh, believes will in him have eternal life. Now, that's pretty interesting because he makes this reference in verse 14 where he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so that's a fairly obvious reference. Anybody that knows the basics of the old law and also the basics of the Gospels knows that that's a very one-to-one uh, -one correlation between this story about the serpent that Moses lifts up on this, uh, this rod and it being very similar to Jesus, who, of course, is going to eventually be lifted up for all to see on a crucifix. And so there's this correlation between these two things, but... At first glance, it may not be very obvious why Jesus is making this comparison here. So let's go ahead and go back to the story that Jesus is actually referring to to get a little bit more background. In Numbers 21, verses 4 through 5, we see that Moses is recording this story and telling what happened. And we'll give a little bit of the background before the actual events of the story, the reason that this story has taken place. Then they set out from the Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient because of the journey. So the people spoke against God and Moses, Why have you brought us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we are disgusted with this miserable food. So a couple things that I'd like to point out in this particular passage. First of all, it's interesting that they became impatient because of the journey. 
So here's the first question we should all ask when we're looking at this, because remember, this is a number, so they've been in the desert a little while. This is probably several years into their, their journeys in the desert. We don't know exactly when in that 40-year time span this episode takes place, but we know that it's been a little bit of, uh, a little bit of time. Why are they in the desert in the first place? Why are they wandering around in the wilderness at this point? Right, because of their rebellion. So you could say that the fact that they were impatient because of the journey may or may not be justified, at least in human terms, because they're getting a little restless. They've been there for a while. But it's always important to remember that they are the reason that they're in the wilderness in the first place. So, yes, you could kind of understand the frustration, the anxiety, the wanting to get this 40 years over with. But at the same time, they are the reason that they're there. So it's kind of like a kid. You can understand that he's frustrated that he's been in time out for 10 minutes. But at the end of the day, he's the reason that he's in time out in the first place. So the second point here, why have you brought us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? So this is one of those leading questions it's very obvious the children of Israel, when they're questioning God and questioning Moses here, they're, they're framing it in such a way that there's a no-win scenario. Now, of course, he hasn't actually brought them to die in the wilderness, although, spoiler alert, that is actually what's going to happen for the vast majority of them, uh, again, due to their own rebellion and their own lack of faith in God. And so he says, why have you brought us up to Egypt to die in the wilderness? Well, that hasn't actually been the purpose, but they're sort of implying here that the only reason God is doing this is because he's spiteful, that he has taken them out of Egypt and they're being brought up here. And what's the other implication of that, which is fairly obvious, is that they're actually saying that we would rather be in Egypt than be out here with God. Now think about that for a second and the gravity of that. They're saying we preferred hard slave labor to what we're going through now. Now, is it fair to say that maybe they're exaggerating a little bit? Maybe there's a little melodrama because this is the situation they're dealing with now as opposed to a few years ago, like maybe they would return to Egypt and go, you know what, the wilderness really wasn't that bad. Maybe, I don't know. But the point is, either way, what is going on here is they are essentially saying, we prefer being slaves to Pharaoh than living the way that God wants us to. And unfortunately, that is a reality of the human condition. There are an awful lot of people walking around right now that actually would prefer to be slaves to any number of things. Their own lust, their desires, the concerns of the world, the government, whatever it may be. There's thousands of different idols in the world. But they'd actually much rather be a slave to that than actually live the way that God asked them to because that's going to be too difficult for them in their mind. They may not actually realize they're choosing that form of slavery over being servant to God, but that is ultimately the choice that they are having to make. And then finally in this passage, we're going to see this. For there is no food and no water, and we are disgusted with this miserable food. Now, I find this actually a fairly funny passage. Because they're saying, there's no food and no water, and we really don't like this food we have. Well, you just said there was no food. No, no, there's food. You're just not satisfied with the food you've got. And, you know, we're going to be looking into this uh, here in a second. This is the kind of grumbling and angst that, unfortunately, God has probably grown accustomed to by this point. Because this is something that is a constant complaint for them. Again, this kind of goes back to the whole Egypt thing. They're so bothered by the fact that they don't have the exact kind of food that they want that they're saying, no, no, slavery was better than this. No, no, not having your choice of food, it may not be ideal, but it's not as bad as slavery. And maybe they've forgotten that in this process of leaving and trying to go out into the wilderness. And I think that that really stands as a lesson for us today as well, that sometimes God is going to call us out into the wilderness. He is going to call us out into something that is difficult. And when we're along the way in the journey, we might think, Whew, look at back at that at rose-colored glasses and really, really prefer our life back then. But if we were to go back there, we might realize that really wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And maybe the things that we're viewing as a problem or something difficult, not saying that they're not legitimate concerns, but bringing up the fact that maybe they aren't quite as harsh as we think they are in, com 
comparison to way that, the way that we are now. And so I think that we can kind of look at that and, and just look as, as human beings and reflectively say, sometimes we lose that perspective and forget what we used to be like. Especially when we've become saved, sometimes we, we hit a rough patch or something happens that's unpleasant and we somewhat forget how difficult it was back before our life when we started our walk with Christ. So let's advance to the next few verses here where we start to get into the, the meat and potatoes of our lesson here. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, because we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Intercede with the Lord that he will remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. A couple things I'd like to point out here. First of all, he sent fiery serpents. Now, there's been some debate back and forth amongst scholars as to exactly what this means, what the purpose of this passage is. Generally speaking, when we see the adjective used here, fiery, in Hebrew, what that's talking about is it's describing not the serpents themselves, but it's describing the reaction to the venom. So most people think that this is a kind of snake that when they bite you, their venom creates a burning sensation. Most scholars then have attributed this to probably being a desert cobra because people, generally speaking, when they get bitten by these particular snakes, before they die, they experience a burning sensation in the, the place that they've been bitten. And so that's probably the reason that you're seeing fiery serpents. This wasn't like a supernatural, like a serpent made out of fire that was coming down and biting them. That's probably not what's being described here in the scripture. Most scholars agree that this is probably talking about some kind of uh, brood of cobras that was going around the camp and attacking people. And so, of course, they bite the people so that many people of Israel died. That is pretty extreme. You think about this and you think about what has transpired here that you have a lot of people in the camp. We don't know an exact number, but this was not an insignificant amount of the people that are living in Israel at the time. Many people of Israel died. So, when you get together for the holidays, you're there with your kids, you put something on their plate and they fuss about their food, just remind them that God feels sending a serpent to bite and kill you as an appropriate response to complaining about your food. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> Might be a nice thing to remind them. Anyway, so this is the response that God gives to moaning, grumbling, complaining about the task that he has assigned them to do. But it does go beyond that. And the children of Israel actually acknowledge that in this very verse. They realize the problem was not necessarily the subject matter that they were complaining about, but the manner in which they were doing it. Because ultimately... What they were doing is they weren't trusting God to take care of them. They were not believing that God was going to provide for them, provide for their needs, and eventually fulfill his promises to bring them into the promised land. And so we can see that, that they acknowledge that. They say that we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and against you. So the speaking against Moses isn't necessarily the problem, except for the fact that he represents Moses, or sorry, that, that rep Moses is representing God as God's mouthpiece here. And then the final part of this, we'll look at Numbers 21, verses 8 through 9, the conclusion of this story. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and put it on the flagpole, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten and looks at it will live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on the flagpole and came about, and the serpent bit someone, and he looked at the bronze serpent, uh, and looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So anybody that looks at the bronze serpent that Moses has made here, this person is actually going to wind up living, whereas if you don't, there's no guarantee that you will live if you've been bitten by the snake. So a couple things I want to point out here. First of all, where he talks about making the fiery serpent, this is really just more evidence of what we were talking about earlier. That This probably isn't like a literal snake made out of fire because we know that that's not actually what's happening here because he's making it out of, out of some kind of metal. And so this is just in the likeness of the snake, probably a cobra, like I said, that he's talking about here. And this is something that's actually new in the translation, which I think is a, a better way to describe it. The closest thing that they could find to the Hebrew here is the word flagpole. 
And the reason that they're saying that is because you think about if you've seen uh, Lord of the Rings, when the orcs and the human armies are going in with these like big banners and they hang on this like cross looking thing, that's what it's trying to describe. It's a pole that you use to hang a banner on and the Hebrew word actually describes that which is interesting because we just read a passage where Jesus equates the serpent and hanging up there for everybody to see to him being on a cross. And now we learn that actually the, the pole that was put on there, uh, that, that Moses put the serpent on, is actually also shaped like a cross. It may not have the headpiece there, but it's the same general shape. And so we have that as a, a part that sort of illustrates the similarities between these two as well. And so, of course, he, he continues on. Those who look at it are going to live. So Moses made this bronze serpent and put it on the flagpole, and it came about that if the serpent bit someone, he looked at it and he lived. So this is the story that Jesus is bringing up to Nicodemus that the same way that the only way that somebody could be saved from the venom of these serpents is after they were bitten. So this isn't just like, you know, you, you couldn't write this off as a coincidence, basically. You know, there's some miracles that people try to explain away or some kind of supernatural explanation that they try to explain naturalistically. Some of those attempts are better than others. But in this case, it wasn't just like, oh, well, I looked at the serpent and because I happened to be there, there were no serpents around the bronze serpent, so I lived. No, no, that's not what it's saying. It's saying people that had already been bitten by the cobras go to this statue, this bronze serpent put up on a flagpole, and they look at it, and all of a sudden they don't die. And so this was to erase all doubt that the reason they weren't dying was specifically because of God and Moses doing what God asked him to. There was no doubt in the mind of the children of Israel that this was what was going on. Yes. I agree, and that's an important point, that it wasn't, something to where you could just put this serpent in the midst of the camp and all of a sudden all the people didn't die. It was on an individual basis, wasn't it? That they put it at this central location and then everybody that had been bitten had to come to the statue and see it themselves, look upon it, and then they would be saved. And in the same way, that's how the salvation of Christ works. He has died for all. It's available. Anybody that wants to can come to him, but they do still have to come to him. And so that's kind of the intersection between belief and action, which the Bible defines as faith. It's that belief coupled with the action that follows the, the reaction to that belief. So excellent point there. I'm going to kind of open the floor up to get some of your thoughts on this. So uh, let's look at what this had to do with Jesus and why Jesus is bringing it up. First of all, who was Nicodemus? Okay, he's a, a member of the Sanhedrin. What else? So he visits Jesus at nighttime, uh, probably a, a little bit of not wanting everybody to know that he's having this conversation with Christ. This is probably a little bit earlier in Jesus' ministry. So, yeah, we, we know that about him. What else? He, he's a member of the Pharisee sect. So he is a member of the Sanhedrin, but to be more specific, he's also a member of the, the Pharisaical sect. And the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was that the Pharisees tended to believe in an afterlife. And so one of the things that may be really interesting to point out here is that Jesus is trying to reach him where he is. He knows that he already believes in an afterlife, and Jesus is basically trying to give him instructions on how to get there. That's why he's giving him all this information between flesh and spirit, and he talks about that a man can be born again, and he can live eternally if he is born, and then he has to be born of water and through baptism. And so... In the context of this, he's trying to convey unto him that there is this spiritual message that is underlying the physical act of looking at the brass serpent and being physically saved from physical death. There's also a way to be reborn and to walk in newness of life when one looks upon, figuratively, the Son of God hanging up upon a tree. And so this whole conversation has been about the difference between flesh and spirit and contrasting the two in the Old and the New Testament. And remember that Nicodemus is extremely well-versed in the Old Testament, probably had most, if not the entire Torah, memorized by heart. And so when Jesus makes this somewhat vague reference to the Old Testament, Nicodemus knows exactly what he's talking about. He knows the parameters, he knows the context, he knows 
why God did what he did. He understands the lessons underneath it. He understands the uh, Talmud and the, the interpretation that the Jews had about this. And so Jesus didn't really have to explain himself a whole lot here. That little bit that we saw in that conversation is enough for Nicodemus to know exactly what Jesus is talking about. And so he's trying to draw this understanding that, yes, there is this old physical story about Jesus saving, or sorry, about Moses putting up this uh, serpent and saving people. And in the same way, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up and there's going to be a similar spiritual salvation that comes from that. What was the topic of their conversation this evening? Being born again. And so he's trying to explain to him that there is a way for that to take place and that it's going to come in the same way that it came to the people that had been bitten and their life is about to end and they're able to acquire new life through looking at the Son of Man. And so in the same way that the Israelites were able to save their lives doing that, a similar thing is about to take place. And then finally... How does this illustration advance Jesus' point? So there's an aspect of faith there, absolutely, that you had to both believe that Jesus is who he said he is and that him being raised up on a cross means something in the same way that the Israelites had to believe that this act of going to see the brass serpent was going to save them from that, so that's certainly an aspect of it. Anything else? I think that's absolutely one of his points that he's trying to make because... He keeps trying to say, well, how are you supposed to be born again? And he's, he keeps going back to thinking of things through fleshly terms. And, you know, to Nicodemus' uh, credit, it's easy for us to kind of look back and how did Nicodemus not see it? Well, we have hindsight and we have the entire Bible and Nicodemus didn't have all those advantages. And so Jesus is trying to reach him where he is and explain to him, he says, just like faith is what saved the people when the brass serpent was raised up, you are going to have to have that similar kind of faith and you're going to have to undergo a more spiritual version of that in order to have spiritual salvation as well. And I think that's absolutely true. It's not the physical act of going through water that saves you. It's the faith that is accompanied with that. Now, don't get me wrong. The physical action is important too, just like God wasn't going to save you no matter how hard you believed if you didn't go and actually look at that brass serpent. But the point is, that it's not the physical action itself that is the most important thing. It's the faith in God that accompanies it. And so there is an aspect of faith that goes with the obedience that is also essential there as well. So I, I think that's absolutely correct. So let's go ahead and look at Hebrews 1, sorry, Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law, since it has only a shadow of good things to come and not the form of those things itself, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually every year, make those who approach perfect. So the law, which remember numbers is a part of the law, it's, it's, one of the five, it's uh, contained within one of the five books of the Torah, it's only a shadow of the things to come, but not the thing itself. So what do we know about a shadow? It is similar to the thing that it represents. It has a similar shape. That shape can be somewhat distorted or, or not necessarily 100% clear, but the point is, if you see someone's shadow, you get some sense of who that person is. You get some sense of what the thing that, that is casting the shadow is. It's not a perfect sense, and you can't really flesh it out in any detail, but the point is, there is some similarity between these two things. You know, one thing casts a shadow and another thing casts a completely different looking shadow and you can kind of tell some differences based on this. And the same thing is true with the Old Testament is that when you're looking at this shadow of the serpent that is being raised up on the stake or raised up on the flagpole, it's similar to the thing that Jesus is going to eventually bring to all men, but at the best, it's just a shadow. You can't really see the thing itself until you understand everything that's happening. And so Jesus is doing a little bit of, pun intended, foreshadowing so that when Nicodemus does see the actual Son of Man lifted up on the cross, he's going to look back at that story and go, ah, that makes sense. Now I can see what he was saying there. I can see where the similarities are. So understanding the shadow, first of all, the serpent's are a direct result of Israel's sin. 
there's no question about that. First of all, it's extremely obvious and all the, on the nose, the symbolism that is being presented here. I mean, if you look at the Old Testament, what's the very first thing that tempts Eve to sin? It's the serpent. And so serpents are used in the scripture almost always as some kind of symbol of sin or evil, something like that. And so the fact that the serpents are being brought into the camp and they are a direct result of the people's sin, that's not a mistake. This symbolism was chosen very specifically by God. And then, obviously, what was the sin? Well, the sin was discontentment. The sin was rebellion. The sin was wanting to go back into slavery and preferring to live under the rule of tyrants than living under the benevolence of God. And then the serpent sits on a cross, like we already explained. It would have been something that's very cross-like. And ultimately, kind of what we've already been talking about, that act of faith and submission is what is ultimately going to result in salvation. Because the thing is, we've all been bitten by sin, every single one of us. And that bite is something that was the result of our actions. We've all had the consequences of our sin come back to bite us. Every single human being that I've ever met that's of the age of accountability has had that happen on multiple times. There have been worldly consequences to that, but there's also spiritual consequences to that. And when we're bitten by that, there's only one way to resolve that, and that is to look up at the Son of Man. And that act of faith and submission to what God asks us to do is ultimately what leads to our salvation. You know, the world likes to bring up to that point that there are some people that like the submission without the faith, and that is a real problem, right? We all know people that just want to go through the motions, go through the rituals, and, and just do the things that God asks, but don't actually internalize it and live it and have the faith the way that they should. But what you're talking about is probably a more common problem in the world today, isn't it? That there's a lot of people that want to say that they believe in God and say that they've looked upon the Son of Man, but ultimately they don't actually want to submit and do the things that he commanded. They, they like the, uh, the idea of it, but they don't like the actual living part of it. In the same way that the Israelites seem pretty gung-ho about going out into the wilderness and crossing the desert so that they can get to the promised land, right? But then they realize that, oh, this is not all sunshine and roses. This is going to actually be a challenge. And that's going to require submission and trust in God in order to get through it. Because here's the harsh reality. You're going to go through the wilderness. That's non-negotiable. It's just part of the deal. I hate to break it to you. It happens to everybody. When Christ calls us out to be Christians, he does not cause us to a life of ease or comfort. He calls us out to a wilderness where we have to wander and be pilgrims and struggle for a bit. Now, the thing is, if we actually do what God asks and trust in him, we're going to spend an awful lot less time in the wilderness and a lot more time in the promised land. That is also true. But the point is, the wilderness is non-negotiable. It's there. You have to go through it. If you want to get to Canaan, you have to go through the desert. Now, Israel had to spend an awful lot more time there because they couldn't get their act together, but the point is, that part was going to happen no matter what. So, why did God have Moses make the serpent? Like, God could have had Moses make literally anything and put it up on that pole, so why did he make a likeness of the very thing that was tormenting them? Why did he make, have him make a likeness of that and put that up on the pole? I think that's absolutely correct. I think it was to remind them of what they had done and remind them that ultimately the suffering that they're going through is their fault. That's absolutely true. When Jesus is up on the cross, he is a representation of all the sins of humanity. And not only is he a representation of the sins of humanity, he is also at the same time simultaneously what? A human. Which reminds us that the thing that put Christ on the cross was us. It was our fault. And it was our sins that held him there because humanity needed salvation and because of that he was willing to do that for us. But ultimately we have to be reminded of the fact that that was our fault. And it was us that put him up there in the same way that Israel's sin is what caused the serpent to have to be put up because if that had never happened, there's no reason for Moses to ever put that up. So excellent point there. So why is looking upon the serpent the solution? We've talked about why that symbol is up there. Why, why is it required to look upon it? What was the significance of that? So in both cases, we've invited that in. 
And so it's a, a reminder to us that ultimately our sin is what put, put that up there. I think that's absolutely true. But why the, the serpent itself, why would they put it, uh, why would Moses have put that up? Why is looking at it specifically the solution? Okay, well, now that's a great answer. Um, it's an easy one, but it's a correct one because God said so. Yeah, I, I think that God is offering them a choice. He's not just going to blanket save everybody. He's saying you have a couple of options. You can choose to deal with this problem yourself, or you can acknowledge that you were the cause of it and apologize, repent of it, and in response to that, trust me. It was a lack of trust that caused the problem, and only establishing that trust was going to solve the problem. So, ironically, the problem that was caused by a lack of trust in God is only remedied by an excess of trust in God, that they have to actually trust that he's going to be able to solve the problem for them. Right, God didn't give them a recipe for the antidote. Right, there is an aspect of obedience, but there's a difference in obedience and working it off or coming up with a solution because... If Moses had said, okay, here's the, here's the antidote to the poison. What you do is you take two parts of this and one part of that, and you mix it together and you drink it. Okay, well, that would be a logical way to handle it, right? But God doesn't do that because he wants to make sure that they know that the reason that they are being saved is specifically because of God. So I, I want us to, as we're coming close to the close here, let's look at Romans 5, verses 6 through 10. Uh, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous person, though perhaps for the good person someone would even dare to die. But God dom- demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So this is a reminder of the cause of Christ dying on the cross. Christ died for the ungodly. He did this while we were still sinners. And we were not just sinners, but his enemies. It wasn't just that we were not on God's side. It was that we were actively on the opposite side. And ultimately, that is what every choice to engage in rebellion against God results in, that we are actively opposing God in some manner, and that the only way that this was going to be resolved is not by us repenting. Obviously, that's an important step. But the only thing that was going to resolve that issue is if someone who had not committed any treachery, somebody that had not betrayed God, somebody that was on God's side, decided to make that bridge for us to cross. That was the only way that it was going to be reconciled. And it's interesting that Jesus is the one that ultimately fulfills that. So in the same way that they had to face their sin, face the serpent up there, we also have to face the reality that Jesus being on the cross was ultimately our doing. And I think that it's an important thing to understand here. A lot of people get this mixed up, especially when they haven't really dug into the theology of Christianity. Forgiveness is not a pardon. You know, we want to make it as though our sin never happened. But that's not what happens. In fact, the people that have to go up and look at the serpent, it's not as though the serpent never bit them. They remember the pain of what that felt like. They had to endure some pain on the way to get to the serpent. But the point is, it didn't alleviate the sin. It forgave the sin. It doesn't mean that the sin never happened. It means that it's been forgiven by the person that has authority to do so, and the same was true with us today. True repentance only follows a hard lesson. And I hate to say this, but this is just how humans are, and I'm no exception to this rule. Uh, My dad's philosophy was, let him touch the electric fence a few times. He'll learn. And he was right. Only took one or two times, and I was like, you know what? I think dad's right on that. I probably don't need to do that anymore. And sometimes God does allow us to fall victim to the results of our own sin in order to immunize us from doing it again. Now, it's always better to be able to learn from other people's mistakes or learn from the scripture and never engage in it in the first place. I'm not suggesting that we go out there and try it out just to make sure. But my point is a a truly repentant heart is going to happen as the result of 
of somebody that has engaged in the sin realized that it is not a good idea and decided to trust and follow God as a result, just like the Israelites did in the wilderness. Ultimately, God prefers courage over safety. Safety is not necessarily a bad thing. However, God never makes safety a virtue. It's not a good thing to have people that are entirely safe all the time. Because if God wanted his people to be safe, what would he have done? He would have gotten rid of the serpents. He doesn't do that. Could God have just said, okay, no more serpents anymore? Yeah, I mean, we saw him do that not too far in the past when that had taken place with the plagues of Egypt. When he wanted the frogs gone, the frogs went away. Uh, lice or, or flies or whatever else. God had the power to make that happen. He doesn't do that because he wanted to acknowledge that courage is more important than being safe. Because what do you have to look at in order to resolve the problem? The very thing that you're afraid of. Because if there's a whole bunch of serpents just running wild through the camp and biting people, and if, you, if they bite you, you die, I'd be pretty afraid of the snake too. I mean... People are afraid of snakes already, even when that's not happening, but especially when you probably know people that have died from this, maybe even family members, you're going to be pretty scared of that snake. And the only way to resolve that fear is to look at the very thing you're afraid of. And that's exactly what Jesus' death was as well. Death is the ultimate thing that humans are afraid of, and I mean, there's good reason for that. But ultimately, we have to look at the death of Christ in order to be able to overcome it. Because ultimately, you have to face a fear to learn courage. If you talk to any psychiatrist or somebody that deals with people that have severe fears, phobias, things like that, they'll tell you very fast, avoidance is not the way to solve that problem. Now, there may be different methods and techniques that you can use to sort of slowly acclimate somebody to that thing, but ultimately, they're going to have to face their fear in, over, in order to overcome it. And the same is true with us, whether our fear is a serpent or our fear is death. We're going to have to look up at that and look at Jesus dying on the cross in order to acknowledge the fact that that death is real and it is our fault, but that there is a way to overcome it. So let's look at the death of Jesus. Let's look at the aspects of it, because Jesus really had the worst kind of all possible deaths. Because it instills absolutely everything and incorporates absolutely everything that we are most afraid of, of death. Because it was agonizing. You know, everybody wants to have a painless death. I, I've talked to lots of people about this, and they say, well, I really hope that I go peacefully in my sleep. And that's an understandable thing to want, but the point is, Jesus didn't go that way. It was as painful as humanly possible. The Romans were extremely good at prolonging death. And they made it as agonizing and torturous as humanly possible, and that's the death that Jesus died. It was also early. This is a 33-year-old man, you know, in the prime of his life, as it were. If he had not died on the cross, you know, presumably he would have had a very long life ahead of him, and so a lot of people are afraid of dying young, and Jesus did die young. He was betrayed. Think about that. It wasn't just that he died, but he died as the direct result of somebody betraying him, a person that he loved, a person that he looked after, a person whose feet he washed. That's the person that betrayed him, and that was how he died. It was a dishonorable death. Think about this. He is situated between two thieves. He is counted as one of the worst people. He is being killed by execution. Now, granted, that was more common then than it is now, but either way, it was a very dishonorable death. And he's not only up there, but he's up there probably mostly naked, which, if you understood how serious Jews took modesty, that was, a, uh, that was an affront to him on a personal dignity level as well as the fact that he's being counted among the thieves. It's an incredibly undignified death. So... He not only uh, has no honor, but he also has no dignity because this is a person that is going to be counted amongst vagabonds and evil people. And from the Jewish perspective, this is the worst kind of death. He's also childless. Now, we don't really consider this as much in our modern society, but back in the days of a Jew, they were very afraid of dying childless because that was seen as part of your duty to God that you would bring forth children and, and 
propagate the Jewish race. And Jesus was not married and had no children, and so he dies before he's able to do that, which would have been a real problem for people in his culture at the time. And also, he was lonely. Remember what happened to his friends? All his disciples abandoned him, all but one. John and his mother, that's the only people that are there. His brothers and sisters don't care about him. All his friends have left him. That's the kind of death our Savior died. So when we look upon Jesus, he embodies everything that we're afraid of, everything that we could be afraid of when it comes to death, and he encompassed all of it into his death and faced it specifically so that we don't have to. And as long as we'll look upon that and remember that, and remember that that's what Jesus did for us, that is the way that we are going to overcome death through him. And most importantly, he was innocent. He's the only person that actually didn't deserve death, and he still died for everyone else. And so, unlike all of us who deserve death, he wasn't. And so that's how he embodies everything that we're afraid of. So, the last passage that we'll look at before we close out tonight, Romans 8, 31 through 34. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, who is the one who condemns. Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all the day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you want to understand how these two things relate, the children of Israel brought that on themselves, and it was only because God loved them that he made a way for them to survive that. And he did exactly the same thing with us. Nothing is going to separate us from the love of Christ. And that is why we can face the fear of death. And we don't just, you know, sort of edge across the finish line. It says we overwhelmingly conquer with that love, basically acting as our tailwind. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I was thinking... Because we were talking so much about courage earlier, I thought that this would be a a good thing to kind of dovetail that. So after the time of Moses, we see something happen where at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses dies and then is is buried and uh, Joshua has to take over. And I really love this exchange that we see between Joshua and God in Joshua 1, verses 5 through 7 where Joshua is is having to take up the mantle of leading the Israelites, and he says, No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people a possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according uh, according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you, Do not turn from it to the right or the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. So, a couple things about this particular passage. First of all, it's fascinating to me when God tells somebody not to be afraid, because he knows that we're afraid of a lot of things, and so he kind of has to remind us over and over again that we're not supposed to be afraid. Uh, It doesn't mean that fear is necessarily a bad thing, but he's saying that we need to be reminded of the fact that when we do have fears that we're able to face them as long as he is behind us. You know, the Bible actually, God tells people not to be afraid 145 times if you look through the Old and the New Testament. Now, there's some debate, like some where he kind of says it but doesn't really, or sometimes where it's implied, but it's roughly 145 times. And so because of that, that says to me that God had to remind people an awful lot about this. But 
I think that it also says that God is somebody who wants us to be able to face our fears. And when he's talking to Joshua, Joshua has a lot of things to be afraid of at this point. I mean, first of all, he's going to be fighting in an awful lot of battles, and he's going to be commanding the troops. So, I mean, you could die. That's what battles are. There's one group of people trying to kill the others, and so there's a very high probability that you will perish. And he also has to step into the mantle of Moses. And Moses was somebody that there had never been a leader before him like him or afterward. Uh, Moses prophesies that eventually a prophet is going to rise up and, and basically fulfill the law. But Joshua knows that's not him because Moses essentially tells him that that's not him, that he says it's going to happen in the future. And so because of that, Joshua has extremely big shoes to fill. And so he's having to take care of all these people, and he's having to carry out God's commands. And what God tells him to remind him that he doesn't have to be afraid is he says, I'm going to be with you just like I was with Moses. Now, was Moses a good man? Yes, he was. Flawed, for sure. But he was a good man. But God is reminding him that Moses did not accomplish what he did by himself. The reason Moses was able to do what he did is because he had God helping him. And he says, and I'm going to help you too. So in the same way that he was with Moses and helped him do everything that he did, he was going to be with Joshua. And what that, I think, really says to us is that as long as God is with us, as long as we are making sure that we're doing like he commands Joshua according to the law and not turning for the right or the left, then really who's in the driver's seat doesn't matter all that much. Whoever's doing the leading, as long as they're following what God asked them to do, that doesn't matter. And so as long as we are obedient to God and doing what he asks of us, ultimately we have nothing to be afraid of. Now, if you're somebody that has let their fear get the better of them or has allowed some kind of sin or rebellion to enter into your life just like it did into the Israelites and just like it has for human beings for thousands of years under Christianity as well, that's something that does need to be remedied. But I'm very thankful that we have a Savior that has given us an avenue to do that. And if you'd like to request the prayers of the church or, or confess your sins, you can do that this evening. Or if you haven't taken that step to call upon the Lord and, and look up on the cross and see the death and the sacrifice that Jesus was willing to give for us, you can do that through believing and hearing the word. You can confess your sins to one another. You can repent and you can be baptized into the blood of Christ and rise up with him in newness of life. If that's something that you need, please let your needs be known now while we stand and sing together.